Okay, uh, Earth science time. Shh. I wish that you were not speaking so that it would make it easier for you to hear when I speak. Oof, that one's heavy. Uh, today we're talking about... What would be a really cute title for this? Um, Tectonics. Tectonics. Let's put... Let's spell it with an X, though. Like in the 90s, everything was spelled like that. Tectonics, but... In our tectonics era. Tectonics era. Okay. I am embarrassed to have written that. Tectonics. Um, I have to erase that right now. I'm so sorry. Tectonics. It, it feels ucky to have spelled something wrong on purpose. Tectonics. We're talking about plate tectonics. Tectonics. We'll put tectonics hyphen plate. We need to start over. This is not... I am really embarrassed of myself. I'm going to start blushing. Um, what... From your bell work, would you tell me what is some evidence? This is a good place for us to start. What is some evidence for plate tectonics? Um, Hold on a second. I want you should have raised your hand like this one did. Like, Remember, in science in general, um, but specifically, obviously, we are in earth science. But so specifically in earth science, we we like to talk about what evidence we have that something is true. It's not good enough just to say this is the way it is. We need to provide evidence to support our claim. So if our claim is, let's start with that, actually. I, I, I'll look to the evidence in a second. What is the claim of plate tectonics? Like, what, define what? The formations. Okay, of what? Of what, though? Do Plates, right? Earth's surface, which we'll talk a little bit more about the specifics of Earth's surface in a second. But Earth's surface is made of... <laughs> Plates. I'm going to put that in quotes for now. That do what? The real, the real kicker here is that they move. That's that's the trouble. Um, if you had to guess when it was the science, science doesn't prove anything, but when it was that um, science provided a useful amount of supporting evidence that the Earth is made of plates that move. When do you guess that was? When did science first? support this conclusion just guess yeah that's a good guess that's when a lot of these things kind of happen and hunter says the 18th century so the 1700s that's what we think of like the age of enlightenment like we were learning about how gravity works and that the earth is made of stuff like this instead of earth fire and water. Like we were kind of throwing off the shackles of mythological folklore as an explanation for the way the universe works and and cleaving to the rational ideals but I'm going to tell you the truth. It's like the 1960s. Like, this was proposed earlier than this, but it wasn't until, like, the 1960s, like the 20th century, that this was, we don't prove things in science, but this was shown to be the factual way that it works. So what evidence is there for that? And, and this is, we'll get at why it took so long for this to be accepted by the scientific community. You had your hand up three hours ago. What did you want to say? Um, like, the fossils that were, like, in Africa were also really Yeah. Like uh, let's put um, fossil range. The range of fossil organisms would... I, I wish I had thought of, or maybe the book tells us, um, some specific... Yes, give me just a second, because I want to address that also. But um, Does the book, did the book mention specific fossils? So I wanted to get it right if I can, otherwise I'll just make something up. You know, did, did, when you were doing your reading, did the book mention specific fossils? I don't think so, I don't think so either. Um, the old book used to. Stand by for a second. Bye. Bye. Yep, hold. That's all going to fall down in a second. Let's just make sure that's shut so that we don't have to... We don't have to hear it. Um, hey, stop making noises like that, okay? That is so true. Um, this, this is the better book. Um, Yeah, um, no, this is Glencoe. It, oh, no, I lost my page because of you. Um, this, <laughs> this video is a mess. Someone someone who knows what they're doing should have a turn. Reroll, reroll it. 
Reroll it. Let's redo it. This is for the. This one goes out to all the homies who are just listening. Oh man, I just had it too. I had the actual right page, and now I don't have it anymore. Just be quiet for a second, doll. And if you would be quiet, <laughs> would really help us all out. Okay, I have my page. I'm going to tell you about uh, Sinognathus, which is a kind of mm, critter, <laughs> land-dwelling animal. Uh, a land-dwelling animal, Sinognathus, existed. I'm going to try to represent its range. Whoop, this is a range where fossils of Sinognathus were found. I would guess... <laughs> Just, <laughs> it's, a Monday. it's a Monday. I would guess that this range is bounded by places where they found fossils. Like, if I had to guess, I would say probably one was found here ish and one was found here. So, like, yeah, somewhere over here. So, Sinognathus is found there and here. This is the, this is the African range of Sinognathus. Okay, so, and those are fossils. Sinognathus is a land-dwelling organism. Why is it important that we know it's land-dwelling? And first of all, what evidence, what evidence is there that it's land-dwelling? Do you guess? I mean, I don't know for sure either. But yeah, it probably is a legged thing, right? And it's important because... Yeah, so at, at the time when this organism was extant, when it wasn't extinct, when it wasn't, all of them died out, a land-dwelling organism had a range that extended suspiciously over the Atlantic Ocean. Right? That's its range. And that's a great piece of evidence that this ocean wasn't there at the time. Uh, another one, Glossopterus, which I do know is a plant. That one I have heard of. Glossopterus. Here. Oops, I'm trying to diagram. And here. And here, the whole island of Madagascar, and here, and here. You can <laughs> <laughs> but if you were paying attention, if you were paying attention, you will see where I was diagramming. I'll, I'll tell you them in words. The southeast part of South America, the southern, abandoned the southern part of Africa, the whole island of Madagascar, southeastern Australia, and the central region of Antarctica all have fossils of Glossopterus, which is, as I said before, a plant. And plants are not well known for their swimming ability. Um, obviously, okay, so how do plants spread over bodies of water? Spores and seeds. But even that, for this specific range, right, we don't find them everywhere in the southern hemisphere. We find them in these specific ranges on these continents. And so, and since it's a plant, a land plant, that tells us that maybe those were at one time um, all together. And another one, Lys Lystrosaurus, mm, Lysostrorus, Lystrosaurus, from the name I would guess a dinosaur or at least some kind of reptile, has a range here in eastern Africa and in central India. So you can see the fossil evidence suggests that the, those continents may have at one time been... What's another piece of evidence? Those continents may have at one time been um, contiguous. What's another piece of evidence that these were... that they have moved? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The fit. Um, they, they, they seem to fit. And, and seem to is not usually a good piece of scientific evidence. But if you... Uh, hopefully no one was still using the notes here. If you didn't get it... Okay, uh, they, you can even see from the, where I diagram the fossil ranges, which you can see really good, uh, that if we put, imagine them going like that, I would, I mean, imagine them, you just have to imagine them, um, but also, this one, down to here, and this one, remember this is not life size, up to here, and then because at one time, most recently, the supercontinent, which we now call Pangaea. Pangaea. They fit Pangaea. Um, it's another one. Wait, I got one. 
the Ring of Fire and means all and the San Andreas I really like both of those. Ring of Fire, San Andreas Fault. At first I was like, mm, I don't know, but why? How do these indicate, these don't themselves indicate the motion of the plate tectonics, but the boundaries of them, and they indicate that there are changes on the boundaries in a, in a way that is patterned after what we, we now, with our current technology, associate with the the um, edges of tectonic plates, but the fact that all of these define explain the ring of fire to me for those of us who don't know. I fell in. Yeah, justice fell into the burning ring of fire. He went down, 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 and the flames went higher. It burns, burns, burns. The ring of fire. The ring of fire. Uh, but what? But do but do tell me geologically what about the ring of fire? Yeah, okay. Lots of it's a ring of volcanoes. Obviously, my dots do not indicate the exact location of volcanoes, but I'm doing my best. This is where we find a lot of volcanic activity and earthquake activity, which are not direct evidence that the plates are um well, I guess in a way they are direct evidence that the plates are moving, but they're not they're not showing us on the human scale that plates move, but they are evidence of the amount of energy involved in those changes. Yes. Couldn't that also prove though that the boundaries have Mm. Yeah, I wouldn't say prove because that's not a word. It provides evidence for the the boundaries being the production of new crust. And that's another thing we're going to talk about with this mid-Atlantic ridge that I've already diagrammed years and years ago. Um, so we have... Uh-oh, that didn't quite work. There we go. Um, this is really going to be a trial by fire for that map thing to see if it actually holds up. Um, so these are evidence of the changes and the borders. Oh, I don't really like the word borders. What, would I, what do I wish I had said? Boundaries. Yes. Boundaries. What's other, what other evidence is there that the plates move? Earthquake. That's, I, that's the best one. I was waiting for that one. Um, yes, okay, so earthquakes, I'll put that down too. Great. Nice job, Gunner. Um, and direct evidence, we can directly measure it with GPS. So a GPS transceiver here, I don't know if there is one, but if there were, a GPS transceiver here and one here would show that they are moving apart at a rate of several centimeters per year. Directly measure. We can say like relative to the position of this GPS transceiver, this one is moving away from it at a rate of whatever, three centimeters a year. And that's not a lot, but if we measure that over, you know, there's hundreds of them, and we see all of their motions, and we get a pretty clear picture of the motion of the plates with direct evidence. So this is kind of, this one's kind of the nail in the coffin, because for a long time, the man who proposed this, named Alfred, with, without a V right there, um, Alfred, Wegener was a German uh, geophysicist, and this was kind of the, it was his idea, and he based it off of these patterns that he had seen, the fossil ranges, the way Pangea fits together, and he was something like a laughingstock of the scientific community because he was suggesting that the plates move, that the Earth, or the very Earth itself is immutable as it seems, like everyone's like, oh, you silly idiot. We walk around on this. This is solid ground. This doesn't move. Where what would it move through? There's no. But he was like, "Well, guys, but it do move." Um, almost like Galileo. Remember, that's what Galileo said when he was forced to recant that the Earth goes around the sun. He said, "Well, nevertheless, it does still move. Like whether I've said it does or not, it does actually still happen." Alfred Wegener the same way. It doesn't matter what you guys are saying. It actually does happen, and this is the evidence. And it wasn't until well after he was dead that we directly measured that, yes, these actually do move. Of course, by then, the evidence was pretty clear. All of these things um, fit together. Fossil ranges. Another one we didn't really mention at all is rock types. Um, there's a specific one. The, the Appalachian Mountains here. I diagrammed this years ago. Too. The Appalachian Mountains here and the Caledonia Mountains in, in the northern United Kingdom in Scotland. These are not only the same type of rock, but they are the exact same rock formation. And they're, as we know from the, the Appalachian Mountains, are 
what how old do you remember from last the last uh, time thing we're talking about? Wait. We know, I don't know the exact age. I just, I'm looking for the... No, not Mesozoic. Paleozoic. These Paleozoic rocks of a very specific kind are the exact same as these Paleozoic rocks of a very specific kind. And how does that work unless this land itself has moved? And it has. But relative to what? Relative to what does all of this land move? According to Wegener's hypothesis, which is right, and that's what we call continental Divide. drift, drift. drift. Yeah. continental Divide. drift the motion of the continents relative to what the, relative to us. well relative to each other relative to the mantle is what i'm looking for yeah the mantle um, the mantle but also i'm gonna I, I want to teach you this this is a earth science thing that you should know if i draw this diagram which you will have seen before Mm, this is a good diagram. This is pumpkin pie spice diagram. This is a yeah. This is an autumnal bagel. What do you, what is my what do you think my brown represents here? Crust. What about orange? Mantle. You've seen this one, of course. And then I you've seen diagrams of inner and outer core, but we'll just put core. Now there's another one that we use very frequently in. Earth science, where the the crust is not just the well, we talk more about this other thing. This this idea of the crust plus the top part of the mantle together make up the lithosphere. The lithosphere is that part of crust, the crust, and the part of the mantle that is solid, or behaves mostly like a solid. And then below that is the part of the mantle that behaves mostly like a liquid, and we call that the asthenosphere. And it doesn't, I shouldn't say like a liquid, it behaves as a plastic. It's that part of the mantle that behaves as a plastic, which is that it is, it is solid, um, but it's under pressure and it behaves almost kind of like peanut butter or like, well, like plastic, like it behaves as a solid that has liquid properties. And so that's the asthenosphere. And the lithosphere is actually what's moving relative to the mantle. So it's not really the mantle, it's the asthenosphere. And it's not just the crust that moves, it's the whole lithosphere. So part of the mantle in a lot of places moves along with it. Uh, don't be mean to books. Don't be mean to books. There are a couple different, there are different kinds of crust or different kinds of lithosphere. And we usually talk about continental, and oceanic crust. Which, if you had to guess, is more dense. They're both kind of almost as it were floating on the mantle. But the oceanic is more dense. You're right. How, why do you think that? Pressure. Because it's everywhere. No, it's, um, it's, it's, it's that it is thinner and denser and it sinks lower into the mantle and it's just a miracle that, that happens to be where the ocean is no it's because water as you probably have some familiarity with is going to accumulate in the lowest point right yes. like if i if i spill my celsius it will find whatever part of this really quite uneven floor is the lowest and it will settle there and so since the oceanic crust is more dense that's where the water all accumulates it's not just a, a coincidence that the water happens to be on top of the oceanic crust. It is that the oceanic crust is denser and therefore lower in the mantle, and therefore the water accumulates on it. And that is usually made out of the igneous rock basalt. We sometimes say that it is basaltic. Largely. All, all of it? No. But largely that crust is made of the, of the igneous rock basalt. Which? Basalt. 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 No basalt. <laughs> so if this is true of oceanic crust, what would probably be true of continental crust? Less dense. Less dense. And the rock it is made out of is granite, and so we say that that crust is granitic. <laughs> That's right, granitic. 
And so we have these two kinds of crust, continental and oceanic. And all over the world, um, these things move relative to each other. And in what ways can these move relative to each other? Okay, they can move towards each other, okay, parallel to each other, towards each other, and away from each other. And so we call those um, plate boundaries convergent, divergent, and transform. So in convergent, in convergent, they are moving towards each other. In divergent, they are moving away from each other. And in transform, they're moving, I mean, up and down, but they're moving laterally past each other like that. Asher calls, Asher, I, sometimes you ask him what his favorite transform is, he'll say truck man. He doesn't know his name is Optimus Prime, so he just calls him truck man. Truck man. So, so we have these different ways that the crusts can move relative to each other, and these different types of crusts. And the combination of these two things creates different features. So if we have two pieces of continental crust that are less dense and they run into each other, what do you think that's going to turn up as? Mountain. mountain. We call that folded mountain range. When two pieces of continental crust, when two pieces of continental crust crash into each other, I normally diagram this, but I've kind of run out of room, so I'm just going to explain it with my paws. Two pieces of continental crust crashing into each other form a, a folded mountain range. What if continental crust crashes into oceanic crust. Here they go. Yeah, exactly. The oceanic crust is more dense, and so it goes under, and this is called subduction. I'm just going to write that. Not, see, not seduction. <laughs> subduction. I would guess those words are related, though. Like, seduction is like the person is tricking the other person. I almost said lady and man, but it doesn't matter what gender they are. The person is tricking the other person to come closer to them. That's seduction. Subduction is going lower than. So the crust is going lower than the other crust. Subduction. Um, no, I'm not going to talk about that right now. So subduction, the one crust subducts. It goes below the other one. And then what happens down here as it's more dense than it gets down in the mantle? What does it do probably? It, no, don't say burns. It does what? Melts. Melts becomes magma, which is less dense. And then it goes boop, boop, boop. And that usually makes a volcanic mountain range. So this is going to be a volcano. Subduction. Volcano. And then what if we have two pieces of oceanic crust coming at each other? Um, it, it usually one of them will subduct. They will subduct. Um, that's less common. But okay, what about divergent? If we have continental crusts and they're moving away from each other, like it's a continent, but it's splitting, what do we get? A rift valley. Exactly right. Two different continents. That's happening. We'll talk about... We'll talk about two different places. So here I already have diagram. This line here is the Rift Valley in Africa, which we talked about in the last unit because that's where it seems like the evidence is that human beings probably first came about. Um, so this is the Rift Valley in Africa. And this part of Africa, even though it's one continent, is separating into two. There's another one here in the southeastern United States called the New, New Madrid Fault. And this is where the North American plate is splitting into, and a rift valley is forming. It also is like the most fertile place in the country. Yeah, I don't know that, I, that may be related to the rift valley, but I don't actually know, so I won't attest to that. Um, and then what about, what, about if two, what about if two continental plates, you stay here, what about if two continental plates are diverging? What do we get? Yeah, yeah, this, the Atlantic Ridge, right? We get, a place where the two oceanic crusts are coming apart. In the middle, they're coming apart, and a mountain range is forming called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And on the edges, it's subducting. And so we can actually, we use what's called a magnetometer. Let me write that word down for you. A magnetometer. A magnetometer measures the magnetic field. And the cool thing about this the cool thing about this Mid-Atlantic Ridge is that since new crust is being made here in the middle, right? the mantle is coming up to make new crust in the middle. Since the crust is separating, it opens up, and what's down there? Mantle. So that comes up. It's lava, magma. And so when that's first coming out, that lava, when it solidifies, aligns itself to Earth's magnetic field. So 
there's an area here where all, I've kind of tried to diagram that, where all this crust is the iron that makes it up. It's not just iron, but there's iron in it. The iron that makes it up is all aligned north and south to Earth's magnetic field. But then we get a little bit out of that, and all of the iron in there is aligned south to north. It's the reverse of Earth's magnetic field. Because every 20-ish thousand years, the Earth's magnetic field reverses. Whoop! Why does it do this? I don't know. We'll talk about it later. What does that do? What it does, one thing that it does is provides evidence that this has been happening for a certain amount of time. And the further out we get, we get these like zebra stripes of normal magnetic field, reverse magnetic field. Normal magnetic field, reverse magnetic field. In fact, if you look at your geologic time scale that I hope you still have, Yes. Yours doesn't have it, never mind. If you look at the old geologic time scale that I didn't give you, if you look at the old geologic time scale that I didn't give you, you can see there's these kind of like barcode looking black and white bars here. Those, the, the black ones represent normal polarity of the, of the oceanic crust, and the white ones represent reverse polarity. And so these are times when the north, when the, oh yeah, here camera. The, these are times when the Earth's magnetic field was either normal as it is now or reversed. And we can see those by looking at the oceanic crust. And so this is another piece of evidence that this has been happening for a certain amount of time. Another piece of evidence that the Earth's, that the continents drift, that the plate tectonics are on the move, as the man in the video said. And then what about this transform boundary? They're moving like this. What, no, what's the main thing that happens to the transform boundary? So they are moving laterally by each other. Earthquakes. So earthquakes can happen at any of these, but earthquakes are most common with the transform because they're like, there's, and what happens with an earthquake is it's not like whoop, whoop, whoop. It's like it, it builds up a lot of energy and then goes, and it makes one big motion, motion, and then it builds up more energy and it gets another big motion. Those are earthquakes. <laughs> oh, sh listen, Hunter's asking a question. What's up, Hunter? You know, actually, Hunter, that's a great question, and evidence suggests that the Earth's magnetic field is in the process of reversing right now. So that we, we're some people are a little worried that that might mess up things like GPS and compasses and stuff. Um, but we we don't know for sure. I mean, the last time the the, the evidence suggests that the last time this happened was about twenty thousand years ago, and there was you know people were not terribly worried about it back then. Um, yeah, there were human beings, um, but they were there was not history. We don't know because no one was recording what was going on. Uh, there was one really important thing I wonder. Oh, oh, I should have said this a long time ago. But what is the actual thing that's causing this motion? A lot of people think it's gravity. It's not gravity. What is the energy source for the motion of the plates? Um, heat. heat from where? From, from the core. So, so just like my lava lamp, I got my lava lamp out to just just to show you this, but it's going to burn me when I touch it. I I just no, know it is hot. Yeah, it's not really doing anything yet, but um, like the lava lamp. So imagine this is part of an actual lava lamp and not just, it's not moldy. That's the lava lamp stuff. Uh, just like the lava lamp, it gets hot down here. Someone have a flashlight handy. Like, just give me your phone flashlight real quick. Don't be on, don't be on the camera. Okay, so so it's not being super good right now because it does his phone. It's not very good. But if you imagine Justice's his phone is really hot, the... Uh, I'm just gonna give that back. The, the okay. Now I'm gonna ungive it back. Oh, 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 um, oh! I can't even see it. Thanks. Um, so down here is hot. It makes this what's represented by the lava in the lava lamp less dense. When it's less dense, it floats up, and then when it's up here, it cools down, gets more dense, and sinks. And so there's this continual what we call what process is that? Cycle, but it has a special name when it's heat. Loop. Heat moving in a loop is called circuit. Glue. Fire. Glue. Glue. Con. I'll give you the first. No. Nope. Con. Not conduction. Con. Convection. 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 So this this process of convection. Shh, listen. This process of convection, just like so, the heat source is down here, right? The Earth's core. Why is the core hot? There's two reasons. Okay, it's okay. It's still hot from when it was formed. It's trapped in there. It's still hot from when the Earth formed. And what's the other reason that it's hot? No, radioactive decay is the other one. So, so it, it, the the core is hot, and the mantle when it's down here gets hot, 
and it gets less dense, moves up, and then up here it cools down and it gets more dense. And the same thing happens here, and we get these convection currents, and so you can see at this convection current there's a little bit moving this way, and some of it moving, I, I wanted to, wish I drew this the other direction. There we go. This one's moving this way, and so here we have, in the lithosphere, a convergent plate boundary. Here we have a divergent plate boundary, right? So depending on how the, the mantle is moving underneath, the plates move in different directions relative to each other, and that's what causes these things. Another thing that can happen is right in the middle of, or maybe somewhere uh, towards the middle of this convection current, there might be what we call a hot spot, and this is just within the middle hot spot, like your phone hot spot, um, has nothing to do with this. Uh, might be a place where volcanoes spring up right in the middle of a continent, especially like the Hawaiian Islands are on a hot spot. Hot spot. Hot spot. <laughs> you guys need to be. You guys need to try to be nice to me. I'm trying to teach you something. Um, I know that there's a lot of stuff that I'm forgetting, but do you do you have questions about the stuff we did talk about? The main thing I'm concerned with is that you can you know who kind of was the progenitor of this that you can describe how the plates move and how we know that those are moving. Um, there was an objective. The objective was. Diagram systems of plate tectonics. We did that. I think we did that. I mean, I drew some diagrams. Yeah, that's so true. Do you do you have questions about the systems of plate tectonics? Remember, a system is a group of of objects working together. A group of objects interacting. Do you have questions about the systems of plate tectonics and the evidence thereof? Hi. Hi. Oh, this is one of the worst things I've ever done in my entire life. 